ask you to open to the book of Matthew. We'll be there in just a moment as we're continuing, uh, or I guess picking back up our study of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We've come to the 31st question, and the 31st question, which is about, if you remember the, the last time we had, uh, so two weeks ago, a long time ago, we considered together uh, the 30th question, which was the about the Spirit. ministry of the Spirit. And now we get into, now we the, get details into the details of, of effectual, effectual calling. calling. The Spirit, the Spirit is working in us what we call effectual calling. calling. So, so um, let's, let's have, I'll have, I'll ask the question, and if you'll, and if you'll respond, respond with, the, with answer. the answer. What is, what is effectual, effectual calling? calling? So we see the, this definition of a effectual calling. If you noticed on the first slide, I didn't reference it. I consider effectual calling the hope of our ministry, that God uses means. And the means, the primary means, is the, the ministry of the Word of God. That that's what the Lord's given to us. Whether we're talking about the, the preaching ministry of our church, or all that we do as a church, or we're talking about Canaveral Port Ministry, putting Bibles in people's hands and sharing the gospel there. It's the work of God's Spirit. And it, as, as the Spirit uses us, that's what gives the power to the message. That we would be despondent, or we should be despondent, if we thought the effectiveness of ministry was left solely up to our ability. That there, there'd be no hope for ministry. There, there would we, there'd be great despair if we were honest about our own struggles and difficulties, our own weakness. But the Bible teaches us that God uses weak vessels to do His will to accomplish the salvation of sinners through the work of the Spirit. And you notice there's about four things, five things that are listed here. The convincing us of a sin enlightening our minds, renewing our wills, that we would then embrace the Lord Jesus Christ who's freely offered to us in the Gospel. One of the old theologians that I referenced through the Shorter Catechism Project website talked about ineffectual call. And I don't remember if this was Matthew Henry's commentary or John Flavel's. I didn't write it down. But he makes this observation. When men have nothing but the external sound of the gospel. That in and of itself, just our words, just the external sound is going to be ineffectual for the salvation of sinners. We need the work of the Spirit. I ask you to open to Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. Verse 16. What am I doing wrong? Matthew chapter 20. I looked at this. Oh yes, okay, I'm sorry. For the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. Now, there's that calling that goes off that we, we, we give indiscriminately. And we're looking for the call and the choosing of God to call people to Himself. We should never content ourselves merely with, with uh, hearing the Gospel as James chapter 1 commands us. That we're not hearers of the Word, but doers. And of course, all of that, we are looking to the power of the Spirit of God that is at work in our lives to give effect to these things. As we pray for Canaveral Port Ministry... As we pray for our own ministries, it should always be that the Spirit would give power to what we're doing. That would use our words to accomplish His will. This is the work of the Spirit. And there's great hope in that. Because the Spirit of God, as we, the kids are, are learning their uh, kids' children's catechism... Uh, God can do all His holy will. 
Turn with me to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter one. Pop quiz time. Who wrote Second Timothy? I wish the kids were here for this, right? I could ask them. Because it was not Timothy, but who wrote it? Paul. Why isn't it called first or why isn't it called Second Paul? Right. Well, it's a letter to Timothy, but like Peter is called Peter. It's because he wrote so much. Right? So many letters he wrote. We had to identify them in, in some way. Uh, it is written, if you notice, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, Paul, where is Paul? In jail. He's in jail. What does Paul think is about to happen? He's going to go bye-bye. He's going to go bye-bye. He is going to receive his eternal reward. He's going to receive his uh, full retirement from ministry. As his life, he says later in the book, is poured out like a drink offering. He's writing to Timothy. Who's Timothy? A convert of his. A convert of his. He considers him a son in the faith. Timothy is serving effectively as a uh, evangelist, using that in the sense of he worked under Paul for a time. Timothy served as a pastor. Timothy, Timothy has been entrusted with the truth of the gospel. He's supposed to pass it on to the next generation that the ministry would continue that faithfulness would there that the form of sound words would be passed from generation to generation some people think that as paul writes second timothy that he was concerned about fear on timothy's part whether that was inherent in timothy's makeup as an individual whether that was a sin that timothy struggled with or whether it was paul acknowledging the times in which they're in. I, I've, I've always... I, I love 2 Timothy. You've, you probably know the quote I'm about to share with you from John Calvin. He says that nothing... Paul writes this epistle with his blood. Nothing in this epistle, epistle, nothing he says to Timothy, he himself was not willing to give his life for. Why? Well, let's look at, at a, a small answer to that here. In verse, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 8 does not make any sense if you walk by sight. The entire purpose of jail is what? To discourage that behavior. The, the, the idea of, of capital punishment is to, to put somebody to death who, who, who society, who the government has deemed too dangerous to live. Here's Paul about to die. And he says, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God that is working this gospel. Verse 9 now, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So verse 9 is about effectual calling. He has called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works. Not because he looked down the quarter of time and said, well, this will be a really good asset to the kingdom. I need this person. Not because he says, well, they deserve it. Because then it's wages, right? If it was our works and we deserved it, it would be wages. But in the sight of God, none of us is worthy of such a calling. So it is His purpose and grace. His grace and mercy, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That, that he, He's given to us. And this effectual calling, God will not lose, as we'll see later if we get there, any of His children. Those who he's given to the Lord, those will be saved. Turn over as well to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 
Now notice the, the ministry of the Spirit here. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own hand in the heavenly places. That this is the work of God that opens our eyes, that enlightens our eyes, that helps us to understand the, the hope of our calling. Truly, it's the highest calling that we possibly can have to be children of God. That we would know His power, the exceeding greatness of His power. That's in work in us. That we're not alone in this world. That we have God with us. And let's consider then sort of the specifics of the works. What, what are the works? What, what are the things even uh, helps us understand what's important? Um, I was picked up a book by... Uh, Dr. Truman about the importance of creeds and confessions. So, you know, that's a subject I like called the uh, creedal imperative. I might have that backwards. But, you know, he, he, he made a, a strange observation in, in a way. He said, you know, if you write a book about, if you write a Christian book about becoming a millionaire, that's probably going to be a bestseller. If you write a Christian book about the doctrine of the Trinity, about knowing God deeper, that's probably not. A guaranteed bestseller, even though, you know, one of the sort of modern classics, J.I. Packer's uh, Knowing God is about that theme. But just that people often value certain things, especially uh, physical things, more than they should. So when we think about our effectual calling, when we think about what God is working in our lives, it shows us even what's really important in our Christian lives. And the first one of those is Conviction. The conviction of sin and misery, and we're looking over to Acts chapter 2. This is following Peter's uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit's been poured out. He's gone out. They've, you have the, the gift of tongues that's been given. Everyone's hearing this. they are confused about what's going on. Peter then preaches the gospel to them. You notice what it says. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now the purpose of the sermon was not to make them feel good, but the purpose of the sermon, the result of the sermon, which is a tremendous blessing, is that they were convicted of sin and misery. Now, those two things have to go together, right? Not just sin, but also understanding the vile nature of sin. Understanding the misery of sin. Where does sin lead? It leads to despair and death. And part of the gospel is understanding that what we call the bad news of what we deserve. And now you notice that such despair is not the only thing. They ask this question as they convicted of their sin. What should we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. <coughs> Excuse me. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as the Lord our God shall call. That the first step in preaching the gospel is the declaration, is the explanation of sin and misery. And as people see their condition, they then want to know what to do about it. Now, one of the things that we often have to distinguish about true conviction, true conviction that comes from the Spirit is not merely, how do I get out of trouble? Oh no, I got caught. Now let me say anything 
that will get me out of trouble. The true spirit of conviction is the attitude of the prodigal son when he returned to his father. The prodigal son, as he's gone and wasted all of his inheritance, as he's eating the slop given to pigs, comes to his senses, realizes what his sin has gotten him into, he goes back to the father, and what is he asked to be? He does not ask to be a son. He doesn't ask to be restored. He comes back and says, I just want to be a servant. I just want to be a slave. I just want to be one of your workers. I don't need any position of dignity. That's the attitude of conviction that, that we're looking for, that we're, we're talking about, that the Bible reveals to us. It is understanding the depravity of sin, the wickedness of sin, the vileness of sin, the uh, odiousness of sin before God. It's understanding we've offended God and we, we deserve His wrath and curse. This is part of our effectual call. The modern idea, in, particularly in American churches, of you should come to church and you should feel good about yourself it's kind of a weird statement. I hope that when we come to church, we don't leave just despairing, woe is us, we're undone. Right? Because did these people leave Peter's sermon despairing? In a sense, but then what were they given? They were given the hope of the gospel. Right? That we should be, in a sense, torn down through the, the ministry of the word. Whether we're talking about a, a, a sermon or we're talking about just reading the Bible on our own. We should be torn down so that we come to the end of ourselves and we run to the Lord, that we have this conviction of sin. For us as the people of God who know the gospel, who've lived the gospel, hopefully it doesn't come to such a devastating moment because we're keeping, as, as the phrase goes, shorts accounts with God. We're, we see our sin. We're truly repentant of that sin. The second thing is illumination that we come to an understanding of the knowledge of Christ. And see, these things go together, right? What has Peter done? They've come to the end of themselves, and now he's told them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, by the way, if we were to read Peter's sermon, it would not take very long. Now, that doesn't mean that my sermons are too long. It just means that this is a summary bullet point of what Peter said. So when you read, for instance, uh, that what he says to them about the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, more than likely that was the main heading that he then went in and explained to them. Now, some of it they knew, right? Because Jesus, the Messiah, they, they had some, some understanding as he explained that to them. So there, it's more than just knowing the name of Jesus, but it's knowing about his person and his work. And, and all that's wrapped up in that. Turn over with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 verse 18. Well, let's back it up. Let's uh, start, uh, start in verse 15. Now this is Paul. And this is Paul recounting the Damascus Road experience. But I said, Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So as Paul recounts this uh, Damascus Road experience, his conversion experience there, he speaks about the ministry that the Lord has given to him to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Now that is... He is the vehicle. He's the means. The preaching of the word is the means that the spirit uses to accomplish that. And it, it's describing for us here an understanding uh, being going from dark, darkness of not knowing to light, the light of knowing the Lord. 
And you see that even the receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance, all of that, the knowledge of Christ that we have in the gospel. The other work, or the, the third work, or to, on this particular point about the knowledge of Christ, expanding on that a, a moment, is that He is the only remedy. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I'm going to flip there. I could try and quote it from memory. But again, Peter preaching here. What does he say about Jesus? Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only remedy. The knowledge of Christ is the only remedy. If this is not true, then we shouldn't be doing Port Canaveral ministries. We shouldn't be supporting missionaries around the world. You know, if, if this is not true, if Jesus is just one name among many names, then everything the culture tells us about just do whatever you want here, but don't take it anywhere else, is right. How did our culture get to that point? Because by and large, the church abandoned the exclusive nature of the gospel. It wasn't just one. Jesus isn't the only remedy. Jesus became just one of many remedies. Evangelism and, and mission, or particularly missionary work around the world turned into, let's just add Jesus to what's already here. He's the only name given under heaven whereby men may be saved. John chapter 14 makes it pretty clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. If Jesus isn't the own, own, only remedy, John 3.16 doesn't make a lot of sense. God's given His only begotten Son, only begotten, one of a kind, absolutely unique Son. Why would God do that if He's just one among many? That verse only makes sense if Jesus is the Son of God. He is very God of very God and very man of very God. Or very man of very man. Those two things. He's 100% man, 100% God. Two natures in one person. And if, if sense, I should say, sense that is true, he is the only remedy. But we also must remember, and I think this is uh, another area where people get off the rails, is that he is the all-sufficient remedy. A lot of Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses that would come to your door would actually agree with most of what I just said, but they would not agree with this particular point. So turn over to Hebrews Chapter 7 with me. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So the, the gospel, the work of Jesus on the cross, he declared it is finished. It was truly finished. Salvation was accomplished. Now the work of God and the work of the Spirit is such that in our lives that those who are saved will bear fruits. And, and James makes this point not only in chapter 1, but then into chapter 2, where he talks about looking at Abraham and looking at Rahab that their faith was, he says, completed by their works. Not that there was something lacking in their faith, but it's manifested as true saving faith. And, and just think about it this way. If we understand who God is and who we are, how could we not help but want to serve Him? Now, I've, I've used the illustration. Uh, I used to work a little bit better with people, you know, generally speaking, janitors aren't considered super, super interesting people. But uh, if you see a documentary on the janitor at the White House, you're probably pretty interested in that. Why? Not because of the job being fundamentally different, but because it's in this place of uh, power and authority and history. And, and, and uh, you know, it's interesting to know how they do the time change at the White House. Because they have to change all the clocks and, and things like that. Well, as the children of God, 
Each and every one of us, wherever we're at, we're serving God, which means it's a service even higher than serving at the White House. Whatever you do, do it not unto men, but unto God. Live our lives in such a way that we are a testimony to the greatness and goodness and sufficiency of the gospel. Jesus truly is the only remedy. Jesus is the all-sufficient remedy. And then on, on this theme is this the last thing. And I, I struggled with what to write. We have conviction. We have illumination. And then I, I had flexibility at one time, which just seemed like maybe the wrong idea. So I put life. The idea that he is renewing our wills. I'm going to turn over to Psalm 110. Our desires, our purpose has been renewed. It says in Psalm 110 verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. That the, God's people will be willing in the day of his power. Ezekiel 36 is that, that passage of Scripture uh, about the New Covenant, about the fact that the heart of stone is taken out and we're given a heart of flesh that we can feel, that we can, and, and more than feelings as we, we would modern use it, but the will has been renewed, that we desire to do God's will, that the Spirit is at work in us. When we think about our lives, we think about what's truly important. What's truly important is a conviction of sin, is the knowledge of Christ, is the renewing of our wills that then we might be hearers of the word who are also doers of the word, that we would persevere. As James says in chapter one, being no hearers who forget, but doers who act according to what God has called us to by the power of the spirit. All of this is ours. In Christ. So may we look to Him and serve Him faithfully, trusting in the power of His Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer.